It is a great honour and pleasure to uh, welcome our next speaker, uh, Dr. Ward Dillow, to give the Society of Endocrinology Medal Lecture today. So Professor Dillow uh, started his career in Steve Bloom's lab uh, when he did a PhD looking at uh, mechanisms of appetite control. And uh, during his uh, career, he was awarded a number of very prestigious uh, awards, NIHR awards, and was eventually, when he became professor of, 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 of endocrinology metabolism in 2001, and was awarded a prestigious NIHR research uh, professorship in 2015. More recently, his work has been really more focused on the novel peptide kispeptin, and Walter was the very first person to use kispeptin in humans, and he's been uh, the first person really to show an effect on fertility in amenorrheic women and its safety in IVF. Now, on the non-academic side, Professor Dillow is one of our more sociable members of the society. He's always propping up the bar till late, uh, and I personally always look forward to his funky move on the dance floor, the annual society dinner, which is second to none to Professor O'Reilly, of course. <laughs> so, uh, well, it is, it is a great pleasure to welcome you on stage uh, to give the lecture today entitled Kispectin, a Vital Trigger of Patients with Therapeutic Potential. Thanks, Barbara, for that kind introduction. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to tell you about uh, one of the stories I've been working on over the last 10 years or so, and that's kispeptin. So I'll just start with my conflicts of interest. Um, and I'd like to start by dedicating this lecture to Professor Mohamed Gatti. Some of you will have known him, some of you won't. Uh, he's been, he was working in our lab for over 40 years with Steve Bloom, published over 1,600 papers, and many of you will have sent gut hormone samples for your neuroendocrine tumor patients, and he was the person who set up all the assays and ran the service, and was actually in the lab until about the 4th of January this year uh, when he succumbed uh, to illness. So it's, uh, I'd like to dedicate this lecture to his memory. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is cuspeptin, and um, I, I have to start with these two seminal papers. Some of you may have seen them, some of you may have not, but really these two papers set the whole field alight. So 2003, uh, prior to these publications, nothing very much was known about expectation uh, and endocrinology, uh, and these two papers really set the field alight. So the first paper was from Nicholas DeRue, published in PNS in 2003, and he showed that patients with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism failing to go through puberty um, had inactivated mutations of the kispeptin receptor, the GPR54, it was known then, it's now known as the kispeptin receptor. Um, <clears throat> and then six weeks later, in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, work from Bill Coolidge in Cambridge, uh, with animal work, which I'll show you, and Stephanie Seminar in Harvard, uh, showed a very similar phenotype in both animals and in humans. Uh, and this was really the start of, of the field, which has now resulted in about 1,400 publications in this area over the last decade. So this is some, this is some data from that original publication from Bill Coolidge. This is the uh, GPR54 knockout mice, male wild-type mice testes here. Uh, it doesn't take any mouse experts work out. They're obviously hypogonadal. And this is the female mice, the wild types here, and the knockouts. And they have hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. They also, interestingly, have normal hypothalamic GnRH content. So uh, this may suggest that cuspeptin is acting upstream of GnRH. Uh, and the, some of the work I'll show you suggested this in the original paper from Stephanie Seminara's work with the human mutants. So this is normal male LH pulsatility that you'll be familiar with. This is serum LH. Uh, gold standard surrogate for GnRH pulsatility, which obviously you can't measure, but the LH pulsatility follows the GnRH pulses, and you can see these nice pulses that are needed for, to maintain male and female uh, normal reproductive function. This is the uh, patient in the paper, so with an inactivating mutation of the cuspeptin receptor, and you can see the LH levels are reduced, and the pulsatility is almost non-existent, very low levels. But what they were able to show was that administering GnRH bolus injections, and the numbers here just indicate the doses and hence the differing effects. Um, if you gave these patients GnRH, they responded uh, with a gonadotropin response. So in keeping with the animal data that perhaps cuspeptin is acting upstream of GnRH and the GnRH content is normal. 
Further reports uh, over the next few years uh, showed how important this system was in humans and normal puberty. Uh, so this is a paper from Kamal Tapaglu in, in Turkey, uh, and they showed that inactivating mutations of the KISS-1 gene also result in the same phenotype. No great surprise if you knock out the receptor or you knock out the gene, you get the same phenotype. And then Anna Claudia, Claudia Latrenica's group showed a few years later that GPR54 activating mutations uh, were found in a patient with central precocious puberty. So this really cemented in that this is a fundamental system that's really important biologically in humans as well as animals uh, that regulates fertility. So if you, don't, if you have inactivation of the system, you don't go through puberty. And if you have activation, activation of the system, you'll have precocious puberty. So what is cispeptin? Um, this, is some, uh, this is a slide taken uh, from Google. Uh, so it's the uh, Hershey's Kisses. And a chap called Lee first discovered the KISS-1 gene. He thought it was an anti-metastatic gene, and there's some work in cispeptin and cancer. But he decided that he wanted to be remembered, and here he is today, uh, in 2015. And he decided to name this the KISS-1 gene after these slightly sickly American sweets. The Americans like them. I think they're slightly sickly but they're available in Ikea if you want to try them. Um, and the kispeptins are peptide products of the KISS-1 gene. So these are these amino acid sequences of the common forms of kispeptin. Here you've got uh, the numbers indicate the number of amino acids. 54, we think, is the endogenous form in humans, and that's the form that we've predominantly used in our human studies. But these other 14, 13, 10 shorter forms have this C-terminal decapeptide that's important for biological activity. So it didn't take a great genius to uh, ask the question, if inactivation of this system causes a failure of reproductive function, does this administration of the ligand stimulate reproductive hormone release? And this is just some data from our laboratory, but there's there were, very, there were a very rapid increase in publications in this area from various groups around the world, uh, starting from those seminal papers. So here we've administered ICV administration, so into the third ventricle, intracerebral ventricular administration of cispeptin, into rats. This is the plasma LH in the circulation. And you can see that nanomolar doses, so small doses of cispeptin, cause a dose-dependent rise in LH release. And cispeptin also... Uh, was able to stimulate GnRH release. So this is some data, again, in rats taking rat hypothalamic uh, explants, measuring their GnRH release. This is the basal release with artificial CSF. Uh, potassium is a positive control. And when cispeptin is applied, uh, you can see, that, again, at low doses, this causes a dose-dependent rise in GnRH release. This is some very nice work from Alan Herbson's group in New Zealand, and they've done huge amounts in this area over the last decade. And they show some very early work where they've taken some GnRH neurons here, and this is the uh, electrical firing. As soon as you administer cuspeptin in the water bath, you get this intense depolarization of the GnRH neurons. And what's very interesting, and I think is relevant for function, is that this single incubation causes this intense depolarization, which is relevant for the physiology of this peptide. So this is where we think, based on all of that data, that uh, cuspeptin is acting. It's acting through its cuspeptin receptor, or the GPR54, acting upstream of GnRH and triggering activation of this axis. So if you don't have, uh, if you have an activating mutation of this receptor or the gene, there's no great surprise that this will switch off puberty. So we were very interested in this uh, peptide. We'd actually been looking at this peptide to see if it had any effects on appetite and found none uh, when this paper first appeared. And so... Um, it seemed to be very biologically important uh, in humans and probably one of the most peptides in reproductive physiology since GnRH was discovered. And we thought, well, it'd be interesting to see if administration of the ligand uh, has any effects in humans, as the results in animals had been obviously promising. So we carried out the first study in uh, normal healthy men back in 2004. Um, and what we did was do an intravenous infusion of cuspeptin. This had never been tried before. There's a peptide that would break down quickly. So we decided to go for an intravenous infusion for this first study for safety reasons, uh, obviously for off-target effects. So it was a 90-minute infusion. Uh, the subjects had two cannulae inserted on arrival, and the arrows indicate blood sampling for gonadotrophins and testosterone. Uh, the infusion was for 90 minutes, and the sampling was for four hours. And this is quite pleasing. Uh, we were able to show that without any side effects whatsoever, 
uh, as we increase the dose from very small doses, so this is picomoles per kilogram per minute, so very tiny doses of cispeptin-54 administered peripherally causes a dose-dependent rise in LH release. <clears throat> so very much the animal data has, has led us to our human studies. So we observed the papers that were coming out from the animal studies and, and, and thought what would be relevant in humans as we carried out these studies. <clears throat> and here uh, is just a, a couple of points that suggested from the animal literature at this time that cuspeptin was involved in ovulation. So in rodents, it had been shown that there was an increase in CFOS expression, and CFOS, as you may know, is a marker of neuronal activation. So there's neuronal activation uh, in rats immediately before the LH surge in the cuspeptin neurons. So that suggested that it was perhaps involved in this uh, LH surge. And uh, when C there was CNS injection of anti cuspeptin antibodies in these animals, this blocked the preoperatory LH surge. And for time reasons, I won't get into the details, but to using cuspeptin knockout and GPR54 knockout mice, it was shown that the system was critical for the physiological preoperatory LH surge. And so we decided to uh, see what the effects of the peptide was in women for the first time. And this time we switched to a subcutaneous injection of cuspeptin. We'd shown it was safe. Uh, in men, and obviously subcutaneous in uh, injection would be much more therapeutically relevant later on, and we thought, uh, we'll see if this works. Similar protocol as, as, as in men, two cannula inserted on arrival, and then blood sampling for four hours. And what we were able to show, this was uh, all healthy women, not on any oral contraceptive pill or any other medication, uh, in the follicular phase, was that as you gave, again, small doses, nanomoles per kilogram of cuspeptin, you could get a nice rise in LH. Now, compared to men, in the, this, this rise was relatively modest. You can see the y-axis is about four here. It was about 12 in men. Uh, but this was encouraging, and this was significant. As, as uh, we were generating this data, a uh, paper came out from Manuel tinelson pairs lab, who's done, who's published probably about 50 to 60 papers in this area over the last decade. And they'd shown that there was differential effects to cuspeptin in different parts of the menstrual cycle. And so what we decided to do was to see whether this would be relevant in females. And we took this relatively low dose of cuspeptin that caused modest effects on LH release and tried it in different parts of the menstrual cycle in females. So this is the same women uh, brought up on different days. So they were brought up separately in the follicular phase on two occasions, either having saline or cuspeptin. Again, in the preovulatory phase on two different cycles for saline or cuspeptin. And then again in the luteal phase uh, for either saline or cuspeptin. So each woman acts as her own control. And this is uh, a summary of the data that we obtained after 18 months of uh, working through various Excel spreadsheets of normal healthy women's periods. Uh, and one thing I learned was that nobody has 28-day cycles. Um, so this is in the follicular phase. White is saline, yellow is cuspeptin. And you can see in the follicular phase we have this modest rise in LH. The axis here, as you can see, is broken. It goes up to 100. Uh, the luteal phase, slightly larger effects of cuspeptin. But what was really fascinating was that at this very low dose of cuspeptin, we got this massive rise uh, in the preoperatory phase. So this is consistent with the animal data that cuspeptin was uh, most potent in the preoperatory phase uh, in women. And I'll ask you to just try and hang on to uh, this slide because it comes relevant to the studies I'm going to talk later on in the presentation. So that was all well and good, very interesting. Uh, we'd shown that this peptide in healthy men and women was potent, side effect free, amazingly side effect free when you look at the receptor distribution and seemed to have isolated effects on reproductive function. So the next question is obviously, does it have any relevance in human disease? So the first uh, area that we looked at was women with hypothalamic amenorrhea. And you'll be familiar with uh, this condition. It's women with functional deficiency of GnRH, often due to weight loss, uh, stress, or various other reasons. Genetic component, as has been suggested from the Harvard group in the New England Journal a couple of years ago. Uh, but what ra raised our interest in this was, again, a paper from Tina Sompere's group that had shown in pre rats that had been underfed, so a model of hypothalamic amenorrhea, if you like. When they gave them back, they had, firstly, they had low cuspeptin levels in the hypothalamus, but when they gave back peripheral cuspeptin to these animals, they could restore fertility. 
And so we wondered what the effects of cosbeptin might be in women with hypothalamic amenorrhea. So again, we followed the same protocol that we'd done in healthy women, subcutaneous injection of cosbeptin, and we measured the gonadotrophin response. And what was pleasing to see was, uh, this is the LH rise here, this is the injection of either saline here in blue or cosbeptin, was the uh, cosbeptin was able to potently stimulate LH release in these women. This slide you have to take with uh, a little bit of caution because these are two separate studies shown on the same slide, but it is, and obviously this is healthy women in the follicular phase, this is women with hypothalamic amenorrhea, a few months apart, same dose of, and batch of peptide. But what you can clearly see is that women with hypothalamic amenorrhea seem to be even more sensitive to uh, gonadotrophin response with cosmeptin than healthy women. And this would be in keeping with the animal data, which had shown that these animals have increased uh, cosmeptin receptor in the hypothalamus. So the next question we wanted to ask was, um, we can stimulate gonadotrophin response uh, in these women, but can we restore the LH pulse fertility, which is what causes the uh, problem? So these women will have, uh, similar to that patient I showed you earlier from that New England Journal of Medicine paper from Stephanie Seminara, will have a reduced pulse fertility. Uh, and what we wanted to know was, if we administered cosmeptin to these women, could we restore this LH pulse fertility? And there was good reason to think that that might be a possibility. We know that GnRH neurons express the cosmeptin receptor. This is the graph I showed you earlier from Alan Herbson's group that cosmeptin could stimulate GnRH neurons directly. And where from uh, Bob Miller's group using cosmeptin antagonist that he developed showed that this would inhibit GnRH pulse fertility in monkeys. In healthy men, it had been shown by uh, Stephanie Seminara's group that cosmeptin may be able to perhaps reset the GnRH pulse generator. And work from Edinburgh, from George et al., had shown that cosmeptin infusion in men could perhaps stimulate LH pulse fertility, as shown here. And so we decided to look to see what the effects of cosmeptin administration would be uh, a very low dose is building up in these women with hypothalamic amenorrhea. So this is just a profile of one of our uh, ladies with hypothalamic amenorrhea. She hadn't had a period for seven years. And so it's no great surprise that the serum LH is very low, uh, very, uh, well, zero LH pulse tility. We gave her 0.01 nanomole per kilogram per hour, so a very low dose of cosmeptin. And you can maybe see a shift in the baseline and some glimmer of uh, movement of that baseline as we go up to 0.03 nanomoles per kilogram per hour, so again, still very low doses, the amplitude is now shifted, and the baseline seems to be moving upwards. And at 0.1 nanomole per kilogram per hour, uh, we had a very nice increase in amplitude and generation of this pulsatile uh, LH release. So this is very encouraging. Uh, our future work will look at whether chronic administration of cosmeptin can restore fertility in these women. So if we go back to that 2007 graph that I showed you um, with uh, the effects of cosmeptin being most potent in the preovulatory phase, I got an email from Jeff True uh, back in 2007 who'd read our Jason M paper. I'd never met Jeff before. Referred him lots of patients, the usual kind of, dear IVF, please see and do the needful. Uh, and didn't really understand huge amounts of I about IVF, I can be fair to say at this stage. And he dropped me an email and said he'd read the paper and it was very interesting, and could we do something together? So we wondered uh, whether cosmeptin could be useful in IVF, given that it had such potent effects in the preoperatory phase. And this is obviously an important area. One in six couples suffer with infertility. Over 1% of babies, approaching 2% in certain groups uh, in the Western world, are born through IVF. And just to kind of recap the biology and endocrinology of standard IVF treatment these days, uh, this is what will happen if you undergo an IVF cycle. You'll have FSH stimulation to obviously stimulate uh, ovarian follicle development. At this stage, the eggs are, too immature, are not mature enough uh, to be retrieved, and you obviously need an LH surge, as would happen in a normal cycle. So obviously, naturally, LH uh, is used to mature the eggs, but in an IVF setting, HCG uh, is used to trigger egg maturation. And this acts directly on the LH receptor, as you're aware, but has this potent and prolonged effect. So it's very effective, but the problem is, is it can overdo it. So it can excessively stimulate the ovaries, and it's the main trigger that's used in IVF treatment uh, today. And this can result in a varian hyperstimulation syndrome that you'll be familiar with, 
Um, and this is due to the HCG acting excessively at the ovaries, resulting in stimulation of VEGF, uh, which is thought to be the main mediator. And then that results in pleural effusions, ascites, renal failure, uh, ICU admissions, and a number of deaths each year from, uh, in healthy women who are otherwise healthy but suffering with infertility. So this is where HCG is acting. It's acting directly on the LH receptor at the ovary, and then causing uh, effective egg maturation, but causing excessive stimulation. So we wondered whether cuspeptin could be useful. Uh, it seems to be involved in the preovulatory LH surge, at least in animals. Uh, and importantly, it should give a more physiological stimulation. It's acting only on the patient's GnRH release. And so you'd have a gated effect where you couldn't get maximal, more than maximal stimulation of your GnRH neurons. And this would then hopefully trigger enough LH and FSH to cause egg maturation, but you wouldn't get the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So that was... Uh, where we were coming from, and this, this, this is the original slide I showed you that we'd shown that in the preovulatory phase that cuspeptin caused really dramatic effects on LH release. So there's a biological basis for this. And looking back in the literature, Matsui et al. from Takeda had shown back in 2004, in fact, that cuspeptin can, could induce ovulation in rodents. And this is one of the really very early papers. So in prepubertal rats that have been treated with gonadotrophins to stimulate follicle development, uh, this just shows saline in gray and cuspeptin in black. You can see that cuspeptin is causing an increase in LH release, no great surprise there. But what was very interesting was that the number of mature eggs produced, very low as expected in, in the saline group because they're not getting an LH surge. But cuspeptin caused a, a, a big rise in the number of eggs that were mature, and in fact very similar uh, to the number that was obtained by HCG stimulation. So this gave us at least animal data that we were... Uh, onto something that might be useful. So we came up with this hypothesis uh, that cuspeptin could be a novel physiological trigger for inducing egg maturation in IVF therapy. Um, at this point, we should probably take a pause for about two years to get the funding. It was about 2.2 million. Uh, this was an IMP study, and anybody who's done IMP studies, which means investigative medicinal products, so we're moving from an endogenous hormone to a treatment. It costs a lot of money. So we had to convince the funders to give us the money. Um, so we finally did get funding, um, and this was the study population that we studied. So there were patients coming to the infertility clinic uh, and the IVF clinic uh, for IVF treatment. And essentially, I won't go through all of this, but it's a, an idiopathic, non-endocrine uh, reason for infertility, which is a common, obviously, group of people. So this is the protocol that we used. The patients had recombinant FSH. GnRH antagonist was used, and this is standard treatment, uh, and that blocks a premature LH surge because you've got this uh, uh, gonal F that's causing lots of stimulation to the ovaries, so you don't want uh, the eggs to be released early. When, when you've got sufficient eggs that are of sufficient size, so usually greater than 3 over 14 millimeters, uh, you'll then introduce a trigger, and as I said, that's usually HCG. What we decided to do was replace HCG in this IVF cycle using cuspeptin to see whether this would stimulate egg maturation. Hopefully you'll get egg maturation. If you do, you can then collect the eggs. You can use intracytoplasmic sperm injection uh, to generate embryos at day three and day five, put the embryos back into the patient, and then hopefully they'll get pregnant. Obviously we're endocrinologists and we want to know what the effects of the cuspeptin trigger would be on gonadotrophins, and so we measured the uh, gonadotrophins prior to the injection and 12 hours later. And for reasons uh, that are mainly due to the egg collection, which has to be 36 hours later, these trigger injections are done at between 8 and 10 p.m. We have six hours notice from the IVF team that they need to be done, so we had an IVF rotor for 18 months during this study. So the people at the end who have done all the work for this had uh, an on-call rotor for, for IVF injections. Uh, so this was fairly painstaking. But it gave us beautiful data because we could see overnight what was happening to the patient's LH following the cuspeptin trigger injection. So this was the cuspeptin dosing. We used an adaptive design. We, these are obviously vulnerable women who want to get pregnant. We don't want to expose lots of women to doses that aren't going to work. So we used low doses to start with for safety. Uh, and then uh, looking at the efficacy, we then rapidly escalated to higher doses that were more effective. So moving on to the results. So this was data that we published last year. 
Uh, and this, was, this is just the top two doses showing the serum LH following the trigger. So uh, the trigger's given here about 8 to 10 p.m., and then we've measured the LH overnight. And you can see at the top two doses, you get a nice rise in LH that's sustained. So that, that, that's nice from an endocrine point of view, but from an IVF point of view, we want to know, does it work? Oops. That's not good. Uh, should I press OK? Suspense. Oh. Well, you know the answer now. Go back. Oops. I don't want to say the copy is high. That's what happened. So we had 96% of the patients had mature eggs, which was great, and 91% had sufficient for embryo transfer. This is a bit like my flight yesterday, which was cancelled, but I had to get the train. Okay, so those are the babies from the uh, first study, which was very pleasing. So that was the other thing, was obviously we had biochemical um, increase in LH, we had good oocyte maturation, but it was obviously waiting for pregnancy outcomes, so touch wood, um, all of the babies were born without any problems. So that study was great, we'd shown proof of concept for the first time that cuspeptin could be used to stimulate LH release, induce oocyte maturation, and result in healthy pregnancy. Um, but the real thing that we wanted to answer was that that group of patients was with uh, patients with normal ovarian reserve, and they would have a modest risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, but not very high. But what we wanted to know, having established that this uh, principle could work, was could cuspeptin stimulate uh, egg, egg maturation in women at highest risk of OHSS? And these are women who have lots of follicles in their ovaries, so uh, polycystic. Uh, ovarian morphology or polycystic ovarian syndrome, it's a whole spectrum of normal uh, ovarian follicles to excessive follicles. Um, and the antral follicle count is one of the ways on ultrasound that you can see how many follicles they've got. So this graph shows the risk of OHSS, and this is a paper from 2012 which estimated the risk of OHSS. So if you've got too high an antral follicle count, your risk of OHSS is modest. As you increase the antral follicle count, the risk rises, and in a high-risk group, it rises to almost one in five. And this is the big problem with IVF in terms of safety. So we moved fairly straightforwardly f on after the first study with funding in place to a phase two study, a, a randomized clinical trial of cuspeptin at multiple doses in women at high risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So again, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but these women had a serum at AMH, and you'll be familiar with AMH being a marker of uh, uh, how many follicles that you've got, and the varying capacity, and the antral follicle count gives you additional information. So both of these being high put these women at very high risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So we did exactly the same protocol as last time, using a cuspeptin trigger rather than HCG. Uh, a HCG trigger in these women might result in ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, uh, moderate and severe, of about 20 to 30 percent. So ethically would be not a good idea. So we decided to use cuspeptin to see whether we could get efficacy, but also safety, which was key. So normally, in IVF treatment, women will come along and report symptoms. Here, we wanted to very clearly document whether they were going to get any hyperstimulation syndrome. And so we actually documented early and late 
ovarian syndrome, hyperstimulation syndrome by symptoms, blood scans, bloods and ultrasound scanning. So here we might be over-reporting, if anything, certainly not under-reporting OHSS. And in IVF clinics, OHSS is probably under-reported because you're waiting for the patient to report symptoms. So uh, for this study, we had 60 patients. Again, we used an adaptive design. Uh, these patients should respond similarly to the, the previous patients, but obviously they're, they're higher risk, so we wanted to obviously go safely. And following an interim analysis early on, we moved up to the higher doses fairly quickly. So again, we had some very pleasing results. The oocyte yield, which tells you how many eggs that you, mature eggs that you might expect compared to the uh, number of follicles prior to the trigger that should give you an egg, uh, was very good. The important slide is this, uh, that we had no moderate severe or critical OHSS. So we're looking very carefully and very specifically, more than you do in clinical practice, we found no clinically significant OHSS, mild, which doesn't... Uh, which patients will stay at home for is 5 and 2% early and late. And the vast majority of patients had no symptoms at all. Overall pregnancy rates uh, at 11 days based on the beta HCG was 63%, uh, six weeks 53%, and overall 45%. And you have to take this with a bit of caution because this is small end numbers still. But in the 9.6 nanopole per kilogram dose, which is the best dose in terms of life pregnancy rates, uh, it was 62%, which is about double what you might expect with HCG. So this is really encouraging uh, with my third family. Uh, so these were babies born from this second study. So cuspeptin triggering has led to high rates of egg maturation, no clinically significant OHSS in a high-risk population, which we're very excited about, uh, and good pregnancy rates. The, the thing that's prevented other triggers from coming to the market and affecting clinical practice is that most women want good pregnancy rates but reduce side effects, and we, and we think we may be there, but obviously need to do further work. So our future work, uh, I think currently the work to date and our work has shown that cuspeptin can potently stimulate LH secretion via endogenous generates release. Further chronic studies are needed to see whether we can restore fertility, uh, especially in patients with reduced LH positivity. And we are planning, hopefully with funding, to do a head-to-head uh, multi-center st study looking at the safety and efficacy of cuspeptin versus current triggers. So this, this obviously is a huge amount of work. This is just a small bit of uh, what we've been up to over the last decade, and I just want to highlight some of the people that have been involved. So this is Emily Thompson, uh, who, did, who did the original animal work. Monica Niger and Chana Jaya Senna have been working with nearly a decade. Uh, Ali Ibarra and Alex Komninos, and you'll hear from Alex later today, and Ali on Wednesday, this is Rosheka Ratnapasparthi, who's an ACF with us. Uh, Julia Prague and Sophie Clark have just joined as clinical research fellows with my team. This is Debbie Papalotu, who's an endocrine nurse. This is some of my members of my team. This is Shaku Swami and Choma Izie Mbeya, who are clinical research fellows. Uh, Anna Carby, IVF consultant, and George Christopoulos, who's one of their research fellows. And this is Jeff True, who's head of our IVF unit. Finally, I'd like to thank the volunteers. Obviously, this is huge amounts of input from the volunteers. Uh, our funders, particularly NIHR, have funded me for the last 10 years and given me another five years' worth of funding. Welcome Trust have funded my PhD and a number of fellows, and the MRC have funded uh, both of those projects. And two of my academic mentors, Kareem Miran and Steve Bloom, with whom I've been working for the last 16 years or so, and without their encouragement and enthusiasm, wouldn't be here today.